How many people know that what determines a year isn't necessarily what the calendar says? It's what you do with the days you have. and happy Sunday to you. I'm Pastor Said, the lead servant here at the Place of Change, and I want to welcome you to this Cyber Sanctuary today. I am uber excited, as you can tell, because I believe that the Lord has divinely orchestrated your steps and aligned your path with ours so that we can have this experience together. Now, do me a favor. I want you to get out the bed if you're able to. I want you to get yourself in a posture where you can fully engage this moment of worship and word as I believe this experience is best embraced with your hands lifted up and your mouth filled with praise. We have made it to the month of September and we are glad about it. Now, this month, I'm going to be dealing especially with the theme revisions. We're going to look again. We're going to aim towards seeing again. And we're going to make some necessary edits and adjustments to the visions that God have given us. I believe the Lord wants to minister to the areas of our lives that may have been disappointed by things not happening the way we thought. And I am uber excited to share with you what the Lord has been sharing with me in my time of prayer. So do me a favor, share the post, make this uh, video available to those in your sphere of influence. Maybe you wanna have a watch party or create a moment where we can all gather together I also want you to stick with us so that you can get the full experience. I believe it will be worth your time. Now, if you're a guest in worship, we want to connect with you. There's a way that you can do that. If you want to give your life to Christ and rededicate your life to the Lord, or perhaps you need an e-church family, we want to connect with you. And there's a way that you can do that. If you want to be a blessing to our ministry, you've seen and are seeing the things that God is allowing us to do by grace to impact the community around us as well as to continue to spread the gospel. You can connect with us as well through your giving and their modalities on the screen by which you are able to give and be a part of that. We're excited about the opportunity to worship with you today. And I believe your life is gonna be changed based upon your time with us in this sacred space we call the place of change. Welcome. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you, first of all, just to tell you thank you. Thank you for another day. Thank you for life. Thank you for health. Thank you for strength. Thank you for new mercies. Father, we come to be honest with you today. Today we are here. We're putting ourselves on the altar today. We pray that you would forgive us. Forgive us of mishandling the creation that you called to be so great. Forgive us for mishandling ourselves. Forgive us for every time, forgive us for every time that we felt short. Forgive us for every time that we tried to take ourselves out. Forgive us for every time that we fell short of your glory. We did not live up to your potential. We put ourselves here on the altar today. Forgive us for counting ourselves out. Forgive us for not believing in ourselves. Forgive us for not completely trusting and believing what you said about us. You called us the head and not the tail. You called us to live above and not beneath. You called us the lender and not the borrower. So today, we rededicate ourselves back to you. And we say that we will become everything that you have desired us to be. Everything that you've called us, we call for it to manifest. Manifest in reality. Manifest in our hearts. Let it be so in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
possibilities. possibilities. Now birth. Now birth. A new. A new. Trouble. To obtain it. To obtain it. For it must. For it must. Come to pass. The song says, I decree it. I decree it. Declare it. Declare it. And call it. And call it. In the spirit. In the spirit. To become. What God's design. Bit more. Let's sing it to them. Your future.
Close your eyes right where you are. You don't have to text or comment right this moment. You don't have to share the post in this second. I just want you to take a moment and breathe. The Bible says the Lord is in his holy temple. Let the earth be silent before him. I want us to just take a moment in reverence and worship to the Lord. To the God of all creation. God who reigns and sits above circumstance and situation to the only wise God. We give glory and honor, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. We join in with the chorus of the angelic hosts who cry, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Hallelujah. We give your name praise and glory and we honor you today. We posture ourselves in a place of gratitude. And if we can, we even extend our hands before you in the presence of your majesty. You are the king and you are invited to come in. Worship is not about us. It's about you. It's about you. It's about you. It's about you. Lord, we want it to be known that it's all about you. In you, we live, we move, and we have our being. In you, we live, we move, and we have our being. In you, we live, we move, and we have our being. And so we worship you. your feet the stress of the last week what all we had to go through whatever life has thrown at us we simply lay it at your feet and we just worship you for being God we worship you for being God let the weight of your presence rest upon us today glory of the Lord rise upon us. Let your presence overtake us. We cry holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. 
we acknowledge your otherness, your holiness. You're set apart. You're different. And because you're different and everything about you is different, that's why we take this undivided time to worship you. Yes, we worship you every day, but this is when we gather specifically in a segregated moment to declare you're worthy of the worship. So we shut everything else down and we stop everything else we're doing and we take this moment to gather together in your presence to declare you're worthy of the honor. Hallelujah. You're worth me taking an hour out of my so-called busy schedule. You're worth me taking this moment out of a hectic week. You're worth me putting my workload down just long enough to declare that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I wouldn't even be here today. We bless you. Well, this is the day the Lord has made, and we rejoice and we are glad in it. I want you to know that I miss you. I miss you terribly, and I miss these moments of personal worship where we're able to come together corporately and gather in the house of the Lord, but I'm grateful for our space at the place. I want you to get your Bibles, and I want you to join me in the New Testament Gospel of Matthew chapter 22. For those worshiping with us today, if this is your first time hanging out with us, we want to acknowledge that you have already been uh, been given ways that you can connect with us. And they'll be on the screen again before the service is over. And if those of you who desire to make a decision for the Lord today can do that as well. I want to get right into the word because I have an assignment. We've been talking this month about revisions. And today I have the last of my installments in the series. And I want to lift in your hearing Matthew 22. And I want to read 14 verses of scripture. They won't be very long. I'll get through them as quick as I can. But for those who may not be familiar with this parable, I want you to get the gist of it. Thank you, Jesus. Matthew 22, beginning in verse 1. Jesus also told them other parables. He said, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a king who prepared a great wedding feast for his son. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to notify those who were invited, but they refused to come. So he sent other servants to tell them the feast has been prepared, the bulls and fattened cattle have been killed, and everything is ready. Come to the banquet. But the guests he invited, ignored them, and went their own way, one to his farm and another to his business. Others seized his messengers and insulted them and killed them. The king was furious. He sent out his army to destroy those murderers and burn their town. And he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, and the guests I invited aren't worthy of that honor. Now go out into the street corners King James would say the hedges and the highways and invite everyone you see. So the servants brought in everyone they could find, good and bad alike, and the banquet hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to meet the guests, he noticed a man who wasn't wearing the proper clothes for a wedding. Friend, he asked, how is it that you are here without wedding clothes? The man had no reply. And the king said to his aides, bind his hands and feet and throw him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. I want to look back at verse 11. When the king came in to meet the guests, he noticed a man who wasn't wearing proper clothes for a wedding friend he asked him in verse 12 how is it that you are here without wedding clothes and the man had no reply I want to minister this morning and I'm going to pray for just a moment but I, I, I want to minister this morning using as a thought I've got it covered I've got it covered you're going to have to stick around to figure out what that means but 
If you believe by faith, this word is going to make sense in the end. I want you to type that in the comment section. I've got it covered. Lord, bless the word while it's being preached. Help those who will live by it. Let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. My Lord, my strength, and my redeemer. Amen. I've got it covered. What I love about this scripture is that this scripture has a way, this particular parable, and a parable is... It's a fictional story with a heavenly meaning. It's in, in a sense allegorical. Jesus often told of them, though the Bible also contains others who tells them. They're stories that provide a heavenly meaning, though the stories may not be historically true. Much like the, the parable of the prodigal son wasn't a historical moment, but it yields for us real life meaning in any way. I am intrigued by this particular parable because this parable sums up for us, I believe, the entire Bible in one text. You read with me in this parable about the events of this story that Jesus tells concerning what the kingdom of heaven is like. And in this parable, God is the king, Christ is the son for whom the wedding has been planned. And the Jews were the originally invited guests. Israel, through relationship with Yahweh, though having a relationship with Yahweh, ultimately declined God's invitation to the wedding with his son. If you don't realize already, I am explaining your Bible to you that God set up a relationship initially inviting Israel to the party and they rejected the invitation. Now, I want you to understand something about this wedding. I want you to know that in ancient times, the way weddings worked, is that marriages were often the arrangement by contract between the fathers of the children. And as a consequence, it would be possible perhaps to marry someone you didn't even choose, your father hooked up with somebody else's father and made an exchange. What would often happen is they would sign the contract, however, there would be a period of time before the marriage would be consummated and before the festivities would occur, which is why you could be engaged in Bible days but have to get a certificate of divorce to break your engagement because contract had already been signed, hence Mary and Joseph. And what I want you to see is that there's a period of time between the initial moment of coming together to make the arrangement for marriage and the ultimate sealing of the deal. What would often happen, and I want you to hear this through the lens of eschatology or the end times, what would happen is the bridegroom would go away and would go and prepare a place. And when the house was ready, the bridegroom would come back often like a thief in the night and would then commence with the wedding ceremony and the groom would go and pick up, would come, would return for the bride. And often the weddings in those days, the, the feast, the wedding festivals could last up to a week or so. You remember that parable of, uh, not the parable, but the, the story and the narrative of Jesus when he turned water into wine. They had been in feast so many days that they ran out of wine. I want you to see the pomp and circumstance that would go into the weddings. And unlike now where the weddings are all about the bride, in truth, in those days, the weddings were all about the groom. Now, with that stated, I mention it because when it talks about the king inviting guests to come to the wedding, what I want you to see is that these guests, even if they didn't know exactly when the wedding would occur, they had already in some way been informed that a wedding was going to happen. It wasn't like they were unavailable because it was last minute. This is the king's son who's getting married. The idea is that they would know that, that Prince Akeem <laughs> is coming back from America. Y'all see what I'm saying? They know that a wedding is going to, to take place. And then I think it is interesting then that he says in verse 2, the banquet is ready. Tell the guests to come. It implies they already knew it was coming. Tell them it's time now parable says that those who were invited initially declined the invitation. It wasn't that they couldn't come. It's that they wouldn't come. They ignored the invite. Some of them simply returning back to their busy lives while others violently shot the messengers. Went and, 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 and berated and even killed the messengers and the servants. The messengers and the servants in the parable are Old Testament prophets. Leaning all the way into the New Testament to John the Baptist, who too was killed 
It was to suggest that God is saying, I had an invitation for Israel to come to the wedding with my son, to be in a relationship, and they not only rejected the invitation, but they killed my messengers that I sent to invite them. And God, in this parable, who is the king, decides his own judgment for them, but also decides, I'm going to send out a new set of servants to a new set of people. We call it the New Testament. And he says now it won't be merely me inviting one exclusive group to the party. It's going to be me sending my servants into the hedges and the highways to tell anybody, whoever they are, good or bad, that they can come. That is the Gentiles, who if you are not a Jew, then that would make you a Gentile. Gentile means dog. And I don't want to offend you this morning, but if you are not a Jew, then by the Bible, you will be considered a dog. Now, I know some of y'all are cute dogs. You chihuahua dogs, and that's cool. But others of us are mutts. But whether you are a good dog and a house pet, or whether you them kind of wild dogs they got in India, the bottom line is that what the grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ is, is that the invitation that at one point was only extended to one ex exclusive group of people has now been ex- extended to each of us praise the Lord and we see in this parable the folks marching into the wedding like I pray we're going to be marching into those poles in November now it's amazing and I want you to see this I'm going somewhere that the king loves both his son and loves us enough that he refused to leave his son without a wedding And he refused to leave us without a chance. So he says, I'm going to make sure, my prince, that I'm going to make sure my son has guests at the wedding. And in the same sense, he then allows us a seat at the table. It's not just the plan of salvation. I want to suggest it's the principle of salvation. This is the gospel that God made a way for us to be invited into God's kingdom through relationship with his son. Now, I know I might be boring somebody today because you want to hear about your next harvest. But I want to suggest if you don't understand how salvation is set up, then you will end up missing the greatest that God has for you. I want you to see that grace is what came and got you out of wherever you were in the hedges and the highways and gave you and I an opportunity to come to the party. And I want to preach to somebody today who understands this message of grace, who can testify that it is the grace of God who has invited me into something I didn't ask for and something I did not deserve and some days I I don't feel I'm good enough for but by God's grace I have been invited anyway that he called me now you can't appreciate being called unless you know what it's like to be ignored but to have somebody call you and choose you and send for you and bring you into something ought to make you feel good down in your spirit. And I know how good I feel when I see my phone ring and other people call me who I want to talk to. But to imagine that the king and not just the king, but the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords sends an invitation for me to respond to grace will make me shout when nobody's playing music and it'll make me lift my hands when nobody's watching and it'll make me dance in the rain if I have to to know that the Lord of glory saw enough in me that God called me in spite of my condition in spite of my position in spite of where people dropped me off in spite of how bad things might have been in my past he at least called me anyway and that's why I came running to the party I want to preach to somebody this morning who's just grateful to be in the party. I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm kind of growing tired of stuck-up folks who feel like they're entitled to everything they get. And I can never be grateful and thankful, always looking as a handout for something else because they feel everything they get they deserve to have. I want to know where the people that who know you didn't deserve to have it, that in truth had the statistics worked the way they should have worked in your life, had the odds worked against you like they were destined to work in your life or like the way people said they would work in your life you wouldn't even be in church or lifting your hands or being a part for you to have come from where you come from or come through what you've come through you shouldn't even be in your right mind somebody ought to be locked in jail somebody ought to be burning in hell but for the grace preach Rouse, of an almighty sufficient and sovereign God
God, I have found myself in a party that I didn't even have an original invitation to. And you know how it is when you get to be a plus one at a party you really wanted to go to, but you weren't sure you were going to get on the list. You'd be trying to behave yourself, but the moment you find out you good, you'd be acting a fool because you're so glad to be there that you're looking at everybody else who's sitting around stuck up like, why y'all wasting all these scripts? As good as this, come on, y'all, as good as this food is and as good as this, this DJ is killing and y'all sitting here on your cell phone. Nobody can turn a party out like somebody who knows they didn't deserve to be there. He invited me to the party. Lord, I wish we were in church back in the day because that would be a high five your neighbor moment. But I would tell you, touch somebody and tell me he invited me to the party, which means I don't care if you invite me or not bump you. You ain't never got to invite me to a party. You ain't got to put me in with you. I ain't got to be close to you. I'm glad I've been invited by the king to a party called Grace. So I'm trying to figure out, as celebratory as this moment is, does this story go left? They're in the party. The Bible says the wedding hall is filled with guests. The king is happy because the king has saved the day. And what I want you to see here, what's implied in, in, in terms of the parable, is that the idea is that the son didn't even know there was a problem. It's as if all the people on your child's guest list for their wedding canceled, so you went and found some more people, but the, they don't even hardly know. they just glad to see somebody's in the room. The king is satisfied till he comes around and finds a man at the wedding without a wedding garment. I was trying to figure out what is the significance about being at the wedding without a wedding garment. Until I realized... What a statement it was to be at the wedding without a wedding garment. See, the idea is for everyone at the wedding to look like the king. Hear me. The, the point is for everybody at the wedding to be dressed in proper attire. It reminds me of the royal wedding a few years ago. In England, when they got married and you saw all of the guests typically dressed alike, the women had certain kind of dresses with fascinators, I think is what you call it, on their head, and the men had the long tail tucks with the double-breasted vest. It was sort of a wedding attire that in England, that in Britain, they, they, they knew was customary, and, and yet this man is hanging out at the party. And I was trying to figure out what is it now. Now, some people talk about the wedding garment and they make it doctrinal. You know, it's about the righteousness of God and being clothed in God's righteousness. And I agree. And, and some people say, no, it's not righteousness, it's holiness. It's, it's about sanctification. Well, I'm not going to get into that debate today. Don't worry about it. I want to suggest what Paul, uh, 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 excuse me, what Spurgeon said in uh, 1888 when he identified this. He called the garment the distinguishing mark of grace. It is to have been clothed in a distinguishing mark of grace that would cause a person to stand out and to, and to be apart from what was happening outside the gates. And what I want you to see is that the problem that the king has with this man in this text who does not have on a wedding garment is that you had the audacity to come to the wedding but not wear what's required for the moment. I'm like, God, that's hard. But what the Lord showed me in this, and here's the revelation, this moment requires more of you than that you just come. This moment requires that you also change. Good morning. I know you're waiting on me. I'm here. This is not a moment that you can just celebrate coming to the moment. This is a moment that doesn't just require your arrival, it requires your adjustment. And what the king is trying to figure out is, why are you on the dance floor looking like what you've been through? Oh, they're going to make me plow today. Why, why are you celebrating on the dance floor that you still look like what you came through? The goal of letting you in this room was to expose you to a distinguishable garment of grace to which you would no longer be clothed in your past. You come 
too far to still look like that. Oh, I, I rose today to preach. I came with intentions to preach. I came to preach. If you don't text any amens today, I came because on this final uh, portion of the revisions series, what the Lord has been wrestling in my spirit about my life is, Rousen, how far in me do you want to come? How far in my kingdom do you expect to go without having to change? There is more that I require of you. Will your heart and soul say yes? God says, I want to know why you still look like that. I tweeted this. I texted this the other week. I said one of the hardest things most people will ever do is change. You want to know why I preach it this morning? Because I've already talked this month about the changing of plans. And I've talked this month about how to go back and dust off your vision and get new fresh ideas. But I want to suggest that a new vision means nothing with an old person. If I'm going to be the same old me, then having a new idea will only produce the same old cycle. That if I don't allow God to change what it is within me and about me and expose me to another level, a distinguishable mark of grace. If I don't allow God's power to transform who I am on the inside. And I'm not preaching this to preach bad news. Trust me, I got sugar for you. I'm preaching it so you understand why the Lord's been pricking your heart so much lately. And why the Holy Ghost has been working on your attitude. And why God keeps making you apologize when you don't even think you were wrong. And why God keeps making you forgive people before they even say I'm sorry it's because God is changing you and I know some of us can shout about what the Lord is giving us but you know you've matured when you start shouting about the fact that God is changing you that that in fact the way I used to think and act and behave and react and respond the Holy Spirit won't even allow me to be that person anymore because I've now been exposed to too much kingdom Ooh, it is good to buy. So I've been exposed to too much kingdom. And my message today is about the danger of coming into something you're unwilling to change for. You ever met somebody who wants something but they don't want to change into it? They, they want a mansion but don't want to pay bills on time. They want a marriage but don't want to get rid of everybody else. They want to start a business but don't want the discipline it requires. They want loyal friends, but they gossip too much. You ever met people who claim they want something, but they don't want to change into it? I'm suggesting to you today that God is saying that for the way I want to rewrite your life, it's going to require you to revise the way you have carried yourself. If I'm preaching to you and you're willing to admit it, I want you to type and make it known. I've got some things to change. <laughs> yeah, I've got some things to change. I've gotten to a point that I am mature enough not to have to wait on somebody else to call it out. I don't need a prophet to call my address to tell me what I need to change. I've grown to the point now that the Holy Spirit and I can get together and have conversations on our own about some things that I need to change. I've gotten right to the place that whether the preacher preaches to my situation or not, I I'm able to know. I can sense it when I say it. Who am I talking to? I know it when the taste of the thought comes right up from my mind to my mouth. I know it in the very moment that I'm getting ready to make a dumb decision and the Holy Spirit nudges me on my shoulder. I know I got some things to change. I said this the other week. Please be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. Trust me, when God gets through with me, then I shall come forth as pure gold. I hope you're okay with having a preacher who still got some things to change. I hope you're okay with being with a pastor that still got some things to change because let me tell you something. If you've got a problem with people in progress, then you either need to die so you can experience perfection or you will settle to experience a phony. 
I'm preaching better than these folks in this room saying amen. I said that if you got a problem with people who are in process, then you either need to die and go to glory where you can be in the presence of perfection or you will end up settling for hanging around a bunch of phonies. I would rather be around somebody who's got some flaws but got some truth and can be honest about the fact that I'm on my way to being who God wants me to be. And I'm not all there yet, but by God's grace, I'm better today than I was yesterday. You ought to give God praise because because at least I'm on my way. Now my subject today, my subject, and I'm done. My subject is simply entitled, my subject is titled, I've Got It Covered. And I wanted to know, Lord, what does this message have to do with I've Got It Covered? Y'all want to know? It's summed up in my one point, and you can click me off. Here's the point of my sermon. God never demands change where God doesn't supply it. That's the whole thrust of my message. God said, I will never demand a change from you that I don't give you myself. The king came in the room and wanted to know, sir, why don't you have on a wedding garment? And I said, Lord, that ain't fair. He came in from the hedges and the highways. Who's to say this man wasn't a leper? Who's to say he wasn't a beggar? Who's to say he even had money? He clearly wasn't on the original invitation list, so he wasn't somebody of importance. Why in the world would you be mad at this man for not having on a wedding garment? Who said he had a tailor who could make him a wedding garment? Who said he could make it down to the mall to get a wedding garment? And I had to do some research because, because Christian, the answer isn't in the text. I don't want to preach the verses of the text. I want to preach the culture that sits up under the ground that the text is nestled within. Because if you contextualize the text, then what you'll learn is first lady, in that day, when they had weddings, and particularly if the king did, here's the catch, the king provided the wedding garment. He said, I'm not asking you to show up in, in, in your own apparel. I am providing you with the garment you need. I preached this sermon, I think maybe for the first time, my very first Sunday in this church. You wonder what the name of this sermon was? I did not the same sermon, but the same text. The name of the sermon was called A Place of Change. And the reason why that was my first sermon as pastor of this church was because what I found out in my research is when you entered into the king's palace before you got to the banquet hall, there was a changing room that you were supposed to step into where you took off whatever you had had on when you arrived and you put on whatever the king had for you so that you would be clothed in the king's righteousness and not your own. Lord have mercy and I want to suggest that the king supplies when the Lord requires change from you the Lord supplies you with what you need to make that change. God said I'm not going to ask you to be a patient parent but not give you patience. I'm not going to ask you to be a loving wife, but don't give you the capacity to love. I will never ask you to be anointed and don't put oil on you. I will never ask you to be forgiving, but not give you a heart. Do you all see what I'm trying to suggest? That God says, whenever I require some of you, it's because I supplied it. And whenever I supply it, I'm going to require it. Ooh, this ain't shouting material, but it really is shouting material. It is to suggest that God said, I only ask of you what I have given you. Some time ago, I, I, I ministered out of town as I travel quite a bit, but I'm, particularly before the pandemic. But I was ministering out of town this particular trip, and I had been invited to a church. And uh, to my knowledge, I had not received information, you know, the details and stuff concerning the situation. But I went to the city anyway because I had knew the pastor for a little while, and I knew he invited me to come. And so I went to preach for him. Well, because I felt at least in my my understanding, I didn't know about any arrangements. I booked a hotel. I went up there and did the whole nine. It was a bad 
hotel too. They had, I saw mice and all that. Anyway, don't worry about it. It's, it's, I thought it was a good hotel, but it was like what they had available at the time. And it, it's a long story. But at either rate, I, uh, praise the Lord. Uh, Pastor, don't, Pastor ain't that bad off y'all. Don't, don't cash at me. Well, if you want to, you can. But uh, I, I, I stay in this little hotel and uh, I'm out to lunch that day before I've got to preach and uh, talking about the mice in the hotel that we saw the night before when I get a call from the secretary of the church I'm preaching at the next day. And the secretary calls to ask me, have I checked in my hotel? And I said, what hotel? I said, I got my own hotel. She said, why don't you get your own hotel? We sent you confirmation of the hotel room we got you. I said, well, I, I don't recall no receiving that. Neither rate, uh, what happened was I ended up staying like a dummy in the hotel I was in rather than to check out and go to the hotel they had. Don't ask me what was wrong with me in that moment. I do know why. But anyway, the bottom line is I get to church the next Sunday and I feel real bad and I speak to the pastor and I'm saying, I'm like, doc, please forgive me, bishop. I'm so sorry because I knew I had just wasted their money. They couldn't get a refund on the nice hotel over looking the football stadium downtown it was real nice too y'all with the window view and everything and I wasted the people's money and I want to tell you what that bishop said to me that day and this is why I bring it up it's not what I did it's what he said that got me he said I want you to know some pastor he said I never invite you here and not take care of it's a simple statement, but I, I want you to see the truth. He said, I would have never invited you into a place for which I didn't take care of whatever you needed to exist in that environment. And I hear the Holy Ghost of God telling me to tell you today, somebody who's stuck in a virtual classroom, somebody who's stuck having to work uh, from home, somebody who's stuck in a situation with kids surrounding you all day, yelling in your ear, somebody who's stuck with less income than you usually have. I want to tell you the Lord said I wouldn't invite you into this season and not take care of it. Why do you think you had to book where you get your own clothes and book how you gonna find your own peace and book how you gonna find your own contentment? He said my job is to do the choosing your job is to do the changing. God said, I set up the wedding. I created the opportunity. I already put everything in motion. I've already got the cake cut. I've got the cow killed. I've got everything else roasted and cooking. The only thing I asked you to do was change. God said, I already got your destiny mapped out. I've already got my plan for your life. I know how I'm going to use you when you turn 60. I already know whose life you're going to touch when you in 10 years from now. I already know the stuff you stressed out about. I already have an idea how I'm going to make it work. The only thing I'm asking you to do is just go into the booth court, Kent, and change your clothes. I'm just asking you to put on the Lord Jesus. I'm telling you, put on righteousness. I'm telling you, put on grace rather than grief. I'm telling you, put on the joy. I'm asking you to lay down that spirit of heaviness and pick up the garment of praise. I did the dying on Calvary. I just want you to put on the Lord Jesus. My message today, and I'm done, is called I've Got It Covered. Now that's two things. I hope you see it in both ways that I see it. Because on one hand, I'm talking about provision. The king is saying, I got it covered. You ain't got to make up your own garment. You don't have to find your own righteousness. You don't have to figure out your own change. I provided the change you need for the season you're in. I'm going to say that again so somebody else can clap at home. God said, I already, Joe, provided the change you need for the season. Okay, let me say it the way that I know our saints are going to appreciate it. God says, that's why I allowed things to expire in your life when they did. Because I already knew you wouldn't need it for the season you're in. That's why you got invited to the party and somebody else did not respond to the invitation. That's what it means in the end when he said that many are called but few are chosen. I might have called you and your circle, but your circle wasn't alert enough and sober enough to reply to the call, which is why you're the only one serious as you are about God, and you keep trying to drag them in a la carte to the wedding, and they ain't got a chance to have a seat at your table because they missed the invitation. God said, I already knew the change that you would need, and I provided that change. I got it covered. You know what else that means? He says, I've got it covered. 
Whatever frailty, dirtiness, defects, problems that your life prior to this wedding exposed, when I put my garment on you, I know folks are talking about you and they don't want to take you serious in your call because they're trying to remind you of who you've been and what you were and where you come from and all of the things you've come through. But God said that what they don't realize is that whatever about you would disqualify you is about to be covered in my garment. Oh my God, I feel something stirring up in my belly. I'm trying to suggest to you that the Lord said that grace is a covering. That's all, that's all grace is. Grace is a covering. It's a covering, not a cover up. Grace is not a cover up for wrong. Grace is a covering. It says, I will protect your frailties and have mercy on your failures while I give you a chance to be at the party anyway. And you might be insecure trying to figure out why you at the party, but you better dance with the person who bought you. You better say that even if I don't feel like I deserve a second chance, I'm going to maximize this second chance and while you think I'm not qualified here's the point the only people who think it are people who didn't get invited because the other folks in the room are covered too I might not know what's up under your garment and you might not know what's up under mine but each and every one of us has something up underneath our garment that it took 2020 for grace to cover each and every one of us has some about us, Andre, that we, prior to this pandemic, prior to what's happening in our country, prior to what's happening this season, our fuse was shorter. We were more carnal than we used to be. We, we, we were more frustrated and everything. But somewhere in the process of having to put on this new garment of grace, God is giving us what we need for the season that we are in. I am telling you that if you don't wear this garment, you're going to walk around uncovered and that's what the enemy is banking on the enemy says I don't care that you got a new job I don't care that you just bought a car you can post your car all over social media he said that ain't what I'm after I don't care that you got a raise I want to make sure you're uncovered I want to wait until temptation has stripped you of all of your integrity I want to catch you in the dark when nobody's around you and your title means nothing and I'm gonna wait until you get so frustrated and so upset Set and so angry and so bothered that you ready to throw in the towel and I want to make sure that you are uncovered oh but for the grace of God God said the enemy is after you because he wants you uncovered but I've got a garment for you and I rose to my feet to simply tell somebody who's getting ready to give up and quit and walk out and you feel embarrassed and you feel uncovered and you feel naked and you're secretly scared that people are going to find out what else is in your life. God said if you would just come in the room I've got a covering for you. I'm going to cover your shame. I'm going to cover your guilt. I'm going to cover your insecurity. I'm going to cover your past. I'm going to cover your fears. I'm going to cover you. Somebody ought to worship him this morning. Not because you're rich. Not because you're blessed. Not even because you're black or white or Hispanic. I want you to praise God because you're covered. in your house like I feel the presence of the Lord in this house you ought to type in your comment section and declare God's got it covered God's got it covered hey yaba shora nasi mi yaba manda boho shayababa God's got it covered and no weapon I said no weapon that's formed against you will be able to prosper and every time that rises against you in judgment shall be condemned. God said, I got your children covered. God said, I got your marriage covered. God said, I got your grandchildren covered. I've got your unborn children covered. I've got the seed that haven't even arrived yet. I've got whatever it is you're saying in need of. All I need you to do is be willing to change. And the more you change, the more you're covered. The more you change, the more you're covered. The more you change. Stop being so stubborn.
children. Stop rejecting grace. Stop resisting change. It's not the enemy. It's me trying to put a new garment on you. God wants to do more than change the plan. God wants to change the man. The woman. God said, I'm after a change you. You're so worried about situations and you don't realize that one invitation, <laughs> one invitation will change your whole life. One. That's all you need. One invitation from grace. One invitation. I don't know who I, I'm trying to let this go because I'm over my Facebook time now. And I'm supposed to be logging off and wishing you a great and powerful week. But I want to tell somebody who needs to hear it. You are one invitation away from grace. You want just one invitation from grace. It's going to change everything. Just one invitation. All you got to do is say yes to God. One time. One time. And, I'm, and, 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 and here's what's so crazy. The thing that makes you often wrestle with it is that you don't feel like you can afford it. And the truth is is you can't but you don't have to God said I got it covered all I have need here it is thy hands have provided did y'all catch that great is thy faithfulness Lord, what do you mean so faithful? He's so faithful. God said, I'm faithful through the seasons you thought that your ability to afford grace is what got it to you. So I had to let you fail and let your grace and let your ability account run dry till you realize your degree isn't what's going to get you this. It ain't your good looks. It said, all you have needed, my hand hath provided all your children will need, whether it's virtually or whether it's in the building, it doesn't matter, my hand will provide I know you worried mom or dad for those of you whose kids are going to school and you pray every day they don't come home sick do you really think with all them other children's parents that all of them wear masks you want to know why your child come home well because all that child's health will need my hand has pro you really think exercising and losing weight is what would get cancer out of your body? God said, no, I wanted you to make the change because I needed you to do it for your health. But lest you be confused, there are healthy people who drop dead every day. You want to know why you're here? Because all you have needed. Lord, I wish somebody would get it in their spirit today. My hand has provided. Our response is simply great is thy faithfulness. I know folks are shouting about God's favor, but when you grow up, you stop shouting so much about favor and you start appreciating faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. you where you are. I don't care if nobody can see you. It doesn't matter if you're the only one in your house. It's not about me. It's not about the other people on a stream. I want you for 60 seconds uninterrupted. Open your mouth and worship God if you're grateful for his faithfulness. If the Lord's been faithful and you're grateful, I want you right now to just open your mouth and worship God. Say thank you for the garment. Thank him for the change. Lord, I thank you for giving me the change in the first place. I could have died with a broken heart. I could have had to live my whole life wearing that old me. But I thank 
you that you gave me a chance. Oh, shy, Thank you that you even gave me a chance. I've been complaining about what's not right in my life and fussing about the things I can't control and upset about problems and situations in my life. And I fail to be grateful. Thank you. I'm mad at who's not dancing at the party, who's not clapping with me. I didn't even deserve to be at this wedding party. Thank you. Oh, I want to pray over you. Lord, I'm thankful. In my fleeting moments, I want to pray for you right now. This is what the Holy Spirit told me to pray for. The Holy Spirit told me specifically to pray for this today. The Lord told me to come after the spirit of resistance. What you don't realize is that when you resist grace, you reject it. And when you reject grace in your life, then you end up staying the person you were. And what the enemy does is then he tries to use that condition to convince you that grace wasn't real. You see how it works? So I I resist the change. So now I end up staying the same. And as I stay the same, the enemy says, see, all that change won't real anyway. No, it's not that the change wasn't real. It's that I keep rejecting it. Am I see? I sure. It's not that God doesn't have a calling on my life. It's that I keep rejecting it. I resist and resist and resist and resist. In other words, it's not that nobody offered him a garment is that he wouldn't take it. Maybe he felt I'm not good enough to take it. I'm not worthy enough to take it. Maybe he was wicked. I don't know. Maybe he felt he was good enough by himself. I don't know the reason. And I would suggest that the reason doesn't matter because rejection is rejection. Whether I rejected God intentionally or whether I rejected God and I had nothing to do with God at all, it had something to do with me. When you resist, eventually you will lose. It's somebody's day. I hear the Holy Ghost saying to you specifically, stop resisting me. Stop resisting me. Stop resisting me. Stop coming up with reasons why you're disqualified reasons why you can't have or be what I've called you to have or be. Just stop it. Just stop it. You've done it so long, you now make sense to yourself. You've done it so long, you've convinced yourself you're not worthy. You've done it so long that you've wasted by grace so many seasons now. You could have been leap years ahead of where you are. But you keep resisting somebody said no I'm not resisting God yes you are and you want to know how the same way the first group did in the text because you resist the people God sends to you because God said I keep coming to you in the form of others and when you reject them you reject me And some of us just ignore the help and others of us do like they did in the text and we start killing it off and fighting it and 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 coming to blows with the messengers God says stop resisting me I've got a garment for you I got something I want you to put on hallelujah I got something that I want you to become I've got something that I'm trying to turn you into but I need you to say yes I need you to say yes so right now In Jesus' name, we put up under arrest the spirit of resistance. Devil, we got you surrounded. In security, we've got you surrounded. Come out with your hands up. Hallelujah. Angels have got this soul surrounded. You will not take up residence in the heart of this individual another day in their life. I break I supernaturally break that curse over their life that puts them in unhealthy cycles of giving themselves over and over and over and over again to the foolishness 
of rejection. The devil is a lie. I declare this time when you present the opportunity, I'm going to walk in it. This time when the door comes, I'm going to answer it. This time when I get that chance, I'm going to bust that door wide open. I declare I'm not going to keep resisting it and calling it humility. Asha, or I might see the devil is alive. I'm going to stop thinking so low of myself and calling it humility. It's not humility. It's insecurity which is ultimately a form of pride for me to reject grace. Somebody's soul is up under arrest. Somebody the Lord's been trying to get you in the kingdom and you keep coming up with reasons for why God can't use you. But God said today, we take authority. We put resistance up under our feet and declare victory in Jesus. The curse is broken off of your life. The biggest change you needed was you. So Lord, I declare that if nothing else around me is going to be made new, I refuse to be the person I am. So serious is this thing in my spirit that I feel a heed from the Holy Ghost to give a warning. I hear the Holy Spirit telling me to warn the people of God. He said, warn my people that if you don't change, you will end up like he did. Hallelujah. You will be put in the outer darkness where there's no gnashing where there's gnashing and weeping of teeth there's weeping and gnashing of teeth and out of darkness and judgment in other words if you reject this invitation if you won't change you'll lose out you'll lose out you'll lose out it'd be better to not accept the invitation than to call yourself an accepting the invitation and not make the change. You have the audacity to accept opportunity but won't let God change you into it. You'll end up being put out and out of darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. God said, you've come too far. You have come too far to stay the same. <laughs> you've come too far to stay the same. There is a newness that God wants to release in your life in this new year. In Jesus' name. Bless the Lord. If you know the Lord in the free part of your sin, I want you to pray with me. God, I come in Jesus' name. I confess I am a sinner, but I acknowledge you are the Savior. I believe you died for me, that you rose on the third day for me. And by your grace, through my faith, I am saved. Be my Lord, and I will follow you in Jesus' name. You prayed that prayer. You gave your heart to the Lord. Maybe you rededicated your life to Christ. This morning you made a decision. I'm going to live for Jesus. I've been straying away. But I want to get it right with God. I want you to text that code that's on the bottom of the screen to that number. We want to connect with you. We want to pray with you. We want to lead you in your next decision. You texted SKC Decision 71441 or click that link on the tab. We want to pray for you. We want to lead you into your next steps in God. My prayer has been that this month of sermons has been a blessing to you. You might have to go back and rewind it and replay it and sit with it and, and have that moment with God, but I believe God's going to do something amazing in this new year, in this new decade. I'm excited about what God wants to do with revision. If you haven't had a chance, I want you to be a blessing to this ministry. We don't beg and we don't play games. We're not going to manipulate you into giving. I want to challenge you to feed what's feeding you. Watch what God will do when you sow and when you tithe. To our tithers and our givers, thank you. For those of you who are unemployed, I don't get tired of saying it. You, you're furloughed. You have no income. You can't give tithe of increase you don't have. I want to challenge you to do what you can. And God knows your heart. For those of us who God is still blessing us in that way and that means, we're going to continue to support the work of the King. And my prayer for you is, is that as we go into this week and go into a new month, I want you to remember that all you need, God's hand has provided. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord.
has flowed from the bottom of my heart. This is our confession back to God. To the depths of my soul, yes, Lord, completely, yeah, my soul says yes. I'm going to give the benediction real quick, but oh, yes, Lord, hallelujah, yes, Lord. The part of my heart to the depths of my soul, yes, Lord, completely, yes, my soul says yes. Lord, as we leave this moment of worship, we pray that this word that's been spoken in our hearts would just remain with us. Holy Spirit, sit on us for just a few minutes before we get into the busyness of the day, enjoying the rest of what we have of the weekend. I pray, Lord, that, that you would just sit with us for a minute and seal this word down in our spirits until we know for a fact that we've been with you. Do the work in us this week, and we make that commitment to you that we will not resist your grace, but we're going to put on that garment. We're going to be who you called us to be. In Jesus' name, it is so. Have a blessed week. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. From the bottom, from the bottom of my heart, to the depths of my soul. tuning in to Shekinah Kingdom Church today. We hope that you have enjoyed the service. If you made a spiritual decision today, you can click the link in the bottom of your screen to continue to stay connected with us. Also, you can follow us on any of our social media platforms. We hope to see you again soon and have a blessed week.